and welcome to Connecting Hawaii Business on ThinkTech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, owner of Kathleen Lee Consulting, and I am your host for this program. ThinkTech Hawaii is a platform that encourages a civic engagement through conversations that educate, enlighten, and inspire. We are currently live streamed on thinktechhawaii.com as well as on ThinkTech Hawaii's Facebook page. And if you are tuning in, you can send in your questions live at questions at thinktechhawaii.com. With all that intro being said, I am pleased to welcome our guest for this afternoon. And, and I want to go over how I met him. It's actually, it was through a, a networking page through Facebook, which is a testament to the power of social media. Um, please welcome to the show, Ryan Sung, General Manager of Honolulu Cookie Company. Hey, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being on the show. So tell us a bit about yourself before we launch into talking about managing the family business and how Honolulu Cookie Company has pivoted during COVID-19. Yeah, sure. So um, in that kind of intro or, or that uh, that Facebook networking site, I kind of wrote a little bit about uh, where my background is, but to go over that uh, a little bit, I was born and raised in Hawaii on Oahu here. Um, I went to Kaiser, so public school, uh, not private school, but not to see any private school be there. Um, and then eventually after high school, I moved out to California where you know I attended a community college and then I eventually transferred to USC. Um, from the total time I was gone, I'd say from after high school, it, it was about 10 years before I kind of got the call back where you know, my parents, um, this is a family business. So my parents uh, were wondering if I was interested in learning the business. Um, and so, you know, that opportunity, I think, was was great. It, there was no pressure for me to come back at all. But I think it would have been uh, a missed opportunity if uh, I, I didn't take it um, and uh, take advantage of it at, at that time. So um, I've been back for about five years now. My background is actually kind of interesting. Um, I was I was a kinesiology major at USC, which is kind of like the pre-med route. Um, wanted to do something in the the kind of health field, but um, that didn't quite pan out uh, to to what I eventually wanted to do. Um, after college, I worked in uh, advertising. So my last job before I came back to Hawaii was working at Pandora uh, in the ad sales department. So kind of the ads that you get served on your Pandora platform, that's kind of what the, the, the department I was in, at least on the West Coast. Um, so those annoying ads that you get all the time and you know what, what brands pay for to, to get a, a, an eye or an ear on it. And then you know I came back and kind of learned the business from the ground up, starting at the retail stores, uh, just as a sales associate, um, getting training that way, learning what the customers wanted. Uh, and then kind of go into the different departments, manufacturing, um, kind of quality control, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, training through that route and then eventually becoming the general manager um, to essentially learn how to manage. Um, you know, it's, it's not a skill that can be so much taught rather than learned on the job. Um, and then uh, luckily we have an amazing team to, to help guide me as well. But you know, it's been about five years since I've been back. So definitely a ton uh, of learning experiences during that time. That's, that's very cool. Um, and, and then you took over in 2018. Did I get that right? Uh, yes, I think so. I don't have the exact yeah, date, somewhere around there. Yeah. So you were, yeah. you were now the general manager of this company that was, you know, um, built by your family a few decades ago. And like with that, what are some challenges that you have run into? Just, just challenges in general. And then we can launch into the challenges that COVID-19 has brought to a company such as yours who, you know, was heavily reliant on, you know, um, storefronts, right? Yeah. So I'd say, you know, there's probably several challenges. Internal challenges is a big one. Battling uh, kind of those internal I think a lot of people have that in their mind when they when they join a company or get a position that you know is a little bit um, uncomfortable for them uh, initially. And imposter syndrome is probably how people refer to it as much. Um, that was probably in the beginning. Coming back to a company that you know when I left Hawaii, it was you know maybe less than a hundred people that worked there. When I got back, 
uh, and started learning the business. I think it was close to 300, over 350 people. Wow. So essentially learning the business and, you know, um, uh, making sure that what I'm doing is uh, perceived as correct and, you know, proving to others and along those lines, that was probably one of the biggest challenges I dealt with initially. Um, it wasn't so much learning the business. It was, so, it, it was more so making sure uh, I was living up to, you know, whatever expectations that were set or even not set just based on what was in my head. Um, that's one of the challenges. Another one is definitely, and obviously kind of going back to that challenge, uh, it's gotten a lot better for sure. And it's all just comes with experience. Eventually I got a lot more comfortable and there's things I'm always learning still. I, I never kind of shut myself off to learning experiences. So um, that continuously makes me more and more confident as I, as I go on through the, throughout the years. Um, but kind of the second one, um, this is an interesting one too, is the challenge of working with your family. Um, family business is unique in a sense that uh, I wrote this in that kind of Asian Hustle Network post, but unique in the sense that there isn't as much professionalism probably as there should be. Um, <laughs> we, we, we definitely have, with my parents and I at least, a relationship where well, at times when it suits them, I'm their son, and at times when it suits them, I'm the general manager. So um, it it, it kind of goes back and forth a little bit, but, you know, I'm super fortunate to actually work with my family. I, I enjoy it personally, and those are just kind of little speed bumps here and there. And it's just kind of the what, what goes into working with the family business. Um, you know, on top of that, the, the kind of the last challenges, and probably there's more, but it's just developing the managerial skills um, and leaning on a lot of our executive team making sure our, you know, team members are happy and, you know, they're also uh, exemplifying the values that we set for the company and just making sure all of that tracks in line with kind of what vision we set forth or whatever goals we have um, to, to attack um, for any given year. So um, just constantly developing myself is, is another thing. Um, this role as like family, like general manager is my title, but it is definitely fluid, right? And in a family business, it's, I'm not sure if that's even a Hawaii thing too, where the roles are a little more fluid. You take on multiple hats and, you know, it's not exactly, these are your responsibilities stay within your wheelhouse. It's not so structured like that. So there are things that, you know, we always constantly have to pivot um, and, and deal with what comes our way. So I'd say those are probably the three challenges I'd have. And then um, this is just maybe a side one, but making sure that the business is thriving and in a healthy state for my gen, not only for my generation, um, but even for any future generations uh, for this family business, because this is definitely something that I want to carry on as like a legacy business um, and, you know, uh, make sure that I respect what vision my parents had in place as well, and then kind of take it on uh, in, its, in, in whatever form it evolves into eventually, because it's always growing. That, that sounds like a lot of responsibility and rightfully so, right? I mean, it is a big <clears throat> What are the other hats that you wear or what like the as far as the, the umbrella of what your title or your um position goes like what other tasks or delegations have been upon you yeah so uh i'd say my day-to-day -day in general is making sure i'm tracking with the team um we are a little bit smaller of a company now after covid but you know that's that's it with most most businesses now but um, making sure I'm tracking with the team, understanding that, you know, what everyone's workloads are like, uh, if everybody's moving towards the same strategy, um, making sure we're all moving in the right direction, the same direction, because if, if you know, that direction isn't set, then uh, we could be going all over the place. Um, keeping track in track uh, and in line with everybody also helps me communicate with my parents, Keith and Janet, who are not so much in the day-to-day -day involvement of the operation sides of things. So making sure I can help communicate that to them and then disseminate the information that they give me as well to see, okay, how does this fit in our timelines of projects and whatnot? So uh, over that umbrella of stuff that I just mentioned is probably just management essentially. Um, uh, and then beyond that, right now it's definitely, this is kind of a newer role with the pivot. It's business development. I'd say is uh, I'm heavily involved in right now. Um, and that comes 
in play with making sure that our business is sustainable and we can continue to uh, work towards our recovery. And then, you know, uh, this is somewhat of a game to make it to the recovery period and entering, I'd say last year was survival mode. And this year is definitely uh, a little less than that. I don't even know what you would call that, <laughs> that mode, but um, it's somewhere slightly less than that where, you know, there is actual in between survival. Yeah. And survival it. and recovery maybe that's like it's right in between because recovery and survival because we're not quite at recovery yet um i'd say that would happen once you know hawaii's tourism industry begins to to recover uh in a little more significant of a way so i'd say those are my major two roles um and you know son, <laughs> and, and son which is also be somewhere in there yeah you... like i said what is convenient for them <laughs> So you were mentioning how um, you and Honolulu Cookie Company, as well as most organizations and businesses in Hawaii are on the road to recovery right now. Um, but let's talk about that more. And then we're like, after you respond to this question, we, we're gonna go into break. But uh, what are, like, how has the pandemic affected the operations over at your business? And like, what have you guys come up with? I, I know you had mentioned Costco earlier, but, and I don't know if that came from COVID or that was already in the works prior to that. But yeah, so how has the pandemic affected Honolulu Cookie Company? Yeah, pandemic has definitely hit very, very, very hard um, for our business. Um, you know, I, I might speak a little bit where <clears throat> it sounds like I'm a little bit numb to it at this point. And that's purely off the fact that we've been through over like almost going on a year of this kind of pandemic state. Initially, there was so much uncertainty, uh, really scary time. I remember just waking up every day, every morning and seeing, okay, what's going on in the news? What's going on? Like oh, how many cases? Okay, we're shutting down again. Okay, and then it just kept rolling out, right? Eventually, I think most people got to this, this state of mind where it's acceptance and then just kind of figuring out how to pivot. So, you know, we didn't stay in that panic mode for too long. We definitely had to plan and we had to make very, very difficult decisions during this time. Um, we've scaled back our business quite a bit. Um, I mentioned that, you know, prior to COVID, we had over like 400 employees actually. Um, and we were ramping up in multiple shifts. The demand just plummeted because there was no tourism after a while. And most of our capacity was dedicated to our retail stores. And so, um, you know, now we're sitting uh, at a quarter of that amount of people, essentially. Um, and so it's still a decent amount of staff, but uh, for a business that was at the level, or I guess at the scale that we were at, it's really difficult to scale back that quickly. Uh, and there's so much infrastructure just set in place uh, for that style of business to operate that, you know, we have you know, so many leases out there and we have so much warehouse space to hold everything that we needed to before. And all of a sudden it just turns off and like, you know, the flick of a switch. It's, it was extremely difficult to pivot like that on top of making sure we are keeping our employees safe by, you know, coming up with the protocols and all that kind of stuff, temperature checks, hand sanitizing, um, the social distancing, all those protocols went into place because, you know, we had to essentially write them from scratch. There was no real guidance. CDC was you know, spitting out stuff every so often uh, on, and, and constantly change. So, you know, we wrote the protocols as best we could and constantly kept updating them. But in terms of kind of the, the pivot of the business, uh, I'd say a big part of our business survival strategy and, you know, contingency planning or continuity kind of planning is making sure that we can cut expenses as much as possible. Um, and that's purely out of survival. Hold that thought. Um, so we are going to go on break. But I want you okay. to pick up on that, um, how Honolulu Cookie Company has pivoted um, in order for the business to survive. So we will be right back.
Welcome back to Connecting Hawaii Business on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee of Kathleen Lee Consulting, and our guest for today is Ryan Sung, General Manager of Honolulu Cookie Company. So when we left off, he was talking about um, the challenges that the organization went through because of COVID. So let, let's start with there, Ryan. So you were talking about the challenges and how you guys had to pivot. Like, start from like what the challenges were, and then go from there. Yeah, so the challenges were, you know, some of it were making sure we were putting together the correct protocols during COVID with uh, our employees that came back. Um, I should probably start one step back, actually, because there were challenges being shut down. We, in March, um, we actually shut down our entire operations. Uh, it was a Thursday before the governor shut down the state. And so we did that to keep like how widespread that is. When you say entire operations, like how many stores is that? Yeah, that was uh, 19 locations across Oahu, Maui, Guam, Las Vegas. And so every store probably has a staff of seven to 10 people also, um, and so much product in them as well. And so shutting down and making that call prior to actually having it mandated was more in line with the values that we have as a company, right? We want to protect our employees. Um, that was first and foremost. We saw the COVID, you know, news uh, hysteria essentially going off during that time. And, you know, we wanted to make sure we were providing a safe environment to work in. And so we made the call to shut down Thursday prior to the governor shutting down. I think the governor shut down the Monday after that. And so just flicking that switch off is extremely difficult where we were essentially everybody was, you know, okay, everybody don't come to work the next days. We're going to reevaluate where this is going. We thought we were just going to be shut down for two weeks, you know? Um, and, you know, we, we decided to continue to pay everybody their full benefits and their scheduled shifts um, and whatnot for those two weeks too. And so once it started to become more apparent that this while we wasn't going to turn around as quick as, as we thought we, we then had to make those major changes and calls where, you know, um, I think we were a month in at that point where we finally made the announcements to essentially furlough, start furloughing staff um, to, to start to turn that engine uh, down because there were no stores that were open. Um, I'd say we also shut down our operations or manufacturing operations that includes uh, making the cookies, obviously we didn't need any cookies because nobody was here to sell them to. And then uh, our order fulfillment and our e-commerce type of operations that we send product out. So we shut everything down um, and everybody worked from home. And so that was probably the biggest challenge. And right after that, I think it was like a month and a half or a month in where, okay, things started to maybe slightly reopen here and there, not tourism, but you know, you can start to tick back your businesses and essential business functions. And we started to get more guidance here and there. And so, you know, order fulfillment was kind of our e-commerce was the first thing to kind of turn back on. We could do that in a safe environment. We set up the, the space. So everybody was uh, far apart from each other and whatnot. Um, and then uh, setting all the protocols in place, make sure we'd have no visitors and so on. And so it eventually got down to, I think sometime in, I want to say June, uh, or actually May, May-ish, we, we had to offload a bunch of product. Um, we had a lot of product at our warehouse. And so that product supplied seven days worth of inventory to the, to the stores uh, and all of our customers. And so we had a warehouse, pallets and pallets and pallets. You know, I, I mentioned it was like probably 30, 40 pallets. I can't even remember. It was a lot. Um, but, you know, a pallet is a large amount. <laughs> and so we we essentially reached out to some partners that would might be interested in pulling these products, essential businesses that were open. Foodland was kind of one that helped initially um, and getting some of our products offloaded. And then there was a Costco that eventually kind of turned around to this new pivot partnership. So the plan initially prior to all of COVID was, yes, we wanted to ramp up some type of wholesale strategy where we were offering uh you know, a little bit more of a snacking type option uh, at, at uh, our wholesale partners rather than just gifts. That wasn't going to happen until maybe 2023 or so. So all of that plan essentially moved up quickly to 
2020. And it was based on the fact that now we had this new capacity that we never had before because we were just solely functioning on making sure we can keep up with our, our retail store sales. And so once all that turned off, we had to find another, you know, essentially spigot to turn back on. And it took a lot of time, but I mentioned in May, that's kind of when those conversations happened. And in October, uh, or November, I think it was October, actually. October was when, okay, this is where the Costco, and eventually it evolved into Costco mainland, uh, West Coast, uh, where, okay, all of that work during from May to November on making sure we knew, okay, what type of packaging we wanted to create for Costco, all that kind of stuff. Uh, does the strategy work? It was all a guess. And then it actually turned out to be a great bet for us um, where it is definitely critical in helping to sustain our business now. Um, we have some scale that we're able to work with Costco uh, on the mainland and in our customers on the mainland who uh, typically would come to Hawaii at, during the year that no longer can come here, you know, are able to go to Costco and buy, you know, it's essentially kind of like this large cost. That's sorry, there's a tag on this. This is one of the prototype samples initially, actually. Um, that, a six, while that you're holding up, that is what is now available at Costco in the mainland. In the mainland, yes. This 16 ounce bag of miniature chocolate chip cookies essentially is kind wow. of the snack, snack item. So this is the same recipe and everything as our chocolate chip cookie, full size cookie, and the mini bites cookie that we have at our stores. But that's what we saw as a great platform to initially run out um, to Costco with. And on top of, you know, not only the Costco side, e-com is definitely something we're heavily investing to because getting products out, that's a no brainer for every business right now is that direct to consumer type of business model and making sure we can build that strategy out a little bit. So I'd say hand in hand with wholesale and the e-commerce direct to consumer parts of our business, those are kind of the two that are making sure we can stay afloat until the retail side of our business, that revenue center starts to turn back on and tourism starts to come back. Um, you know, that said, there are some stores open, but it's definitely not the hand, the, the, the majority of them. Um, all of them are just still scraping by essentially um, and making, you know, hopefully tourism comes back, but you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with retail as, as time goes on, but the entire landscape has changed. And, and so we just need to be able to keep up with it. And, um, and then, you know, just the last piece of this Costco strategy is that is kind of that core product that I mentioned that that's was the good introduction. Mm -hmm. And we finally got to the point where, okay, we have seasonal flavors that come out at our own stores. And so Costco is going to participate on, and this is, you know, this is all planned. Costco is somewhat verbally committing to participating in this lemon seasonal flavor that we have that's always popular during the March season for us. We release our own lemon flavors and so we're gonna make a snack size version of that lemon. So I bring that up because it brings it somewhat uh, to fruition, the strategy that we set forth. And it was the way I sold it through was, okay, we're gonna do this chocolate chip cookie and seasonally we, we'll rotate in new flavors. And this is the first seasonal flavor that we get a test with Costco to see if the strategy is actually working. Chocolate chip is doing very well. Um, lemon, we'll see if that does very well too, but it's just, it's somewhat surreal seeing the actual strategy roll out into what we actually thought, or we, we might, we, we thought might work and it seems to be working. So fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. Well, on that note, it looks like we have a viewer question that ties into what you were talking about. So let me just read that over. Uh, aside from your partners in Okinawa and Guam, are there plans or thoughts about an international expansion to help diversify the venues for income generation? Yeah, so international expansion, that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> that's a little harder to do the expansion along those lines. But we did, we have a partner in Japan that already we've been working with. Um, they mainly helped us get into these catalogs that were meant for like JTB, JCB type of customers that travel to Hawaii and they get like a catalog that they can order omiyage from. And so those partners, we had worked, we worked with them to try to help pivot our e-commerce business. So what we did was essentially, uh, you know, our thought was, how do we make it more convenient for our customers outside of Hawaii to get our products? And the only way is to get the products to them. And so we are working with our partner to provide him um, inventory essentially 
to sell our exact number of SKUs that we sell on our own website in the U.S. as mirrored in Japan. And so they can order in Japan, uh, two-day shipping kind of thing. Shipping is fairly cheap in Japan once it gets there. It's obviously not cheap getting the product there. Um, but that's one part of the business. And then we do have plans to expand the snack type of uh, wholesale product out to Japan as well, potentially maybe even Korea, but these are all somewhat still in the works and it does take really long to get to that point. US was, you know, five months worth of time. And this might not be as long as five months because we have somewhat of a, you know, the executed plan in place. And so now it's just kind of making sure we work with the importers and all that kind of stuff properly. So there are definitely plans to get product outside of Hawaii, just uh, what type of products is a little bit more limited. And I think that'll keep somewhat of the exclusivity in Hawaii for people wanting to come back to our stores still, um, that kind of desire. Well, on that note, we are coming to the end of our segment that actually went faster than I thought. And I learned so much from your operations. Any final words and how can people learn more about your company? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, I'd say the easiest way is to sign up for our newsletter online. Um, you can go to our website, honolulucookie.com to do that. Uh, follow us on social media. That's a really good way to see what we're coming out with. We're still doing seasonal rotations of packaging flavors. We have promotion uh, promotions that we run several times uh, throughout, you know, every every month or so. And so that is the best way if you want to keep up uh, to date with what's going on. And, you know, I encourage you to continue to support local business as much as possible because everybody needs it for sure. Thanks, Ryan, for coming on the show today. And thank you to Jay Fidel and the entire staff at Think Tech Hawaii. We had Haley helping us out today for making the show possible. And on that note, um, thank you again, Ryan. And we hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Aloha.